Okay, so we will get started. Oh, and I'm gonna ask, thank, uh, thank you for, for that little interruption. I'm gonna ask everyone who has not already muted themselves to please mute yourself. Um, welcome to, to everyone who's joining us on the call today. I'm Emily Zilber. I'm the Director of Curatorial Affairs and Strategic Partnerships here at the Warden Eschrick Museum. I'm so pleased for you to join us to, for today's Creatives on Eschrick talk with Christian Burchard, who I'll introduce in just a moment. Um, first, we hope that you'll join us for some upcoming virtual programs. I'm excited about uh, our program, uh, our next Spotlight Talk on August 24th at noon, which will focus on um, Eschrick's connections to the New Jersey coastline, his love of sailing, and then take a deep dive into his annotated woodcut map of Barnegat Bay, which journals his summer adventures with friends like Henry Varnum Poor and Theodore Dreiser. So a really fun and uh, thematically appropriate late August uh, spotlight talk. We also hope that you'll come and visit us now that we're open again to the public. Um, Wood and the show that Christian is a part of, the, the top three prize winners are on view in our visitor center through September 12th. Um, and then Roberta Massage, artist in residence, is on view through the end of this year. Both of these exhibitions have great online components, so I encourage you to, to spend some time with them, um, uh, even if you can't make it to visit us on site. Um, I'm really pleased to welcome Christian to the Asherick Museum today. If you came to the opening for Wood End, um, which is our juried exhibition this year, focusing on how artists are combining wood with an additional material in their practice. You got a taste of Christian's thoughtful and really iterative approach to making that has so much resonance for me with Eshrick's own approach. I'm really glad that we get to dig in a little more deeply today. Um, born in Hamburg, Germany in 1955, Christian's been living in the US since 1978. He started out as a furniture maker's apprentice in Germany in the mid 70s and studied sculpture and drawing. Um, he opened his studio in Southern Oregon in 1982 with an early focus on furniture and interiors and gradually shifted towards vessel oriented sculptural forms and sculptural turning. His work has been included in most major turning related ex exhibitions of the last 20 years. Um, has been exhibited widely throughout the United States and can be found in over 30 public collections, um, including LACMA, the Museum of Arts and Design, the Renwick Gallery. He currently resides on the outskirts of Ashland, Oregon, and he is coming to us from, um, from Ashland today. So uh, we're, we're thrilled to have him, him with us here. We'll get started very quickly with the conversation. We'll have about 25 to 30 minutes of conversation with Christian and myself. Again, I'll ask you to mute yourself if you haven't had a chance to do that already. We'll make sure that there is time for questions at the end and conversation. Um, feel free to put questions you might have in the chat throughout. If we can answer them during our conversation, we will. I have my colleague, Katie Wynn, um, on the call today helping out with that. And if we don't get to them during the conversation today, we will save them for the end. Um, and without further ado, let's get started with our conversation with Christian today. I'm going to share my screen here so we can look at some fantastic works. So welcome, Christian. We're happy to have you here. Can Christian hear me? Yes. Hi, Emily. Okay. <laughs> I do. Happy to have you here today. Um, well, thank for, you for inviting me. Oh, absolutely. Um, first, I want to offer you my congratulations on winning the second prize in this year's juried exhibition. Um, I know you were a little surprised to get notice of that decision. Uh, particularly because the work that you entered into the, the jury um, is so different from what you're best known for, pieces that look a little bit more like the baskets that I'm, that I'm showing here or 
your fantastic books or your your wall pieces and the piece that that received second prize in in the juried exhibition this year riff on a Don Son Nagoni uh, is is very different for you. So I, I'd love for you to give us a little bit of an overview of the piece and how you decided to to create it. Well, what the the real surprise was being you know getting this award was because I made this very very much for myself. There wasn't really I wasn't making art or something. I was just I had started to learn. Um, how to put a stick into a hollow form, put a skin on it, and then put some strings on it. And fascinated uh, with what, what happens when you do that. And so for a few years, experimented, learned a little bit more. I'm very lucky to have a friend who's an instrument builder. And so I got a little advice. And so this, this it's called a Nagoni, it's West African instrument. It normally looks quite different. It's much bigger. The gourd is very large and it's used in, in hunting rituals in um, West Africa. And I have made a lot of these uh, turned baskets gourds and I had a lot of them left over and some of them that stayed around their form was maybe not as great. And then I thought, well, let's just use them. I've been recycling quite a bit of my own work. You know, it's mine. I, it's still there after enough years. Let's, let's, let's play with it. So what we have here is a, so it's a steam bent piece of yew. Um, there is a bleached um, madrone root vessel, and then there is um, deer rawhide stretched over that. So everything that makes music here comes from tension. Um, mm -hmm. So you get the tension in the hide, and then we have a goat gut string that is stretched, um, and then it has a you know traditional bridge. And uh, the, the attachment here is leather straps, which is what was used a long time ago before people came up with peg or guitar tuners. And they're a little tricky to adjust, they're kind of hard on the hand, but um, you know, visually looks great, especially with all the straps hanging down. And, and, and uh, it is uh, played, you know, there's six strings and uh, the right hand is mostly played a little higher up. And it's very much, it's a rhythmic, pretty loud instrument in these kind of rituals. So this one is fairly quiet. And, and I just get a kick out of, you know, you're putting these different parts together and wow, look what happens, music comes out of it. And I'm a little slower on the play in the music, but um, I just love making these. It's interesting to me that, that in putting them together, you've got this wonderful mix of, of sort of traditional forms and materials, right? You're talking about the leather strapping that is traditional to this and then, um, that creative reuse of, of your own work, um, something that's a little new and innovative. It sounds like you, you found a way to meet in the middle with, with these kinds of works between your own practice and, and sort of tradition. Yeah, and I just love making them. I mean, this is like mm. Sunday, I'm going in the shop, I'm gonna work on my instrument. It just gives me a lot of pleasure because there's no, this isn't out for the market. This is necessarily made for somebody. Mm -hmm. That's what happens. I mean, the most exciting thing is then you start stringing it and the sound comes out, you know? So, mm. and, and, and these turnings are pretty thin. So there's a, you know, and the holes actually that you see here are important for the sound to come out. Most of the big gourds, you actually cut a hole into it. So. so it's it's the fact that these are not sculptural forms, right? These are not sort of sculptures of music. You, you look for, I... Can you hear me now, Christian? Yep, yep. Okay, perfect. <laughs> um, the fact that these are not sculptural forms, right? These are not sculptures of instruments, but it's really important that they're that they're playable. I just want to show here an image right. so so that folks can get a, a sense of the scale and and um, uh, what we're looking at here in terms of how it relates to the body. Um, you know, I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about how when you make something like this, you balance the visual with, with the auditory. I know it's important to have the holes in, in the vessel, but those are there before you start making them, right? And they shape, I imagine they shape the sound. Right, so it has right. to be this constant back and forth. Well, and functionality in this case is is the most important part. And then I try to make it as beautiful as possible. And, mm. um, you know, I have collected enough woods. I got enough resources for different necks. And actually at the beginning made my own gut string. That's a kind of a smelly, messy affair. And <laughs> now I've been getting gut string from Morocco. 
And um, yes, but functionality is first and then everything else you hope comes together. I, know, this I, is a very simple one. So this has six strings. I have one here with me that's like 16 strings and it gets much more complicated. And then all of a sudden, the bigger you get, uh, there's a learning curve here. I mean, my first ones are pretty simple. It's pretty funky. And so, um, so if, it gonna, sound, if it doesn't sound good, it ain't worth making. No, no, absolutely not. If it's meant to be a musical instrument, um, oh, we'll go go back there um it needs to it needs to play beautifully and and on that note, i know um uh we'd love to see a little bit about the piece that you have with you and um okay. you know give you the opportunity to play it and i'll i'll suggest to folks that they can pin christian's um uh, video screen if they'd like to see this more close up than than the way they're watching it right now i'll say so i won't be able to see myself no, you should be able to see yourself. I still have the image of me playing. All right. Well, let's see if we can do. Let's see if we can spotlight this. Is everyone seeing Christian? No, I'm going to sit back a little bit. So this is what this is from the same okay. family called a Nagoni, but this is a Kamala Nagoni. This is not a ritual instrument. We have a bigger gourd here. The again, the hide, uh, the beads, and the gut, the gut strings. Some of them actually harp strings, but they're still gut strings. And you can see there's a lot of pegs on here. And, um, you know, I don't play West African music. I'm listening to some of the rhythms and I just. So there's lots of music like this out on, on, on YouTube. I listen and I try to, to learn by just listening and pick things up. Um, it kind of fits, it fits their 16 strings and you can you can play with them and, and, and create rhythm. I think it's what it's I think it's what's called a yeah, there's different names for it because you do create the rhythm at the same time as you as you play it. And um, I'm actually got three more happening in my studio right now. And one of them is more in the direction of um, um, oh, a brain band, like a larger 21 string Cora. And all mm -hmm. of a sudden, there's lots of rules. So all of a sudden I'm going, okay, I got to pay a little bit more attention. And I love the learning part of it. I love the learning part of it. And, and, and the process is slow. I'm in no rush. So, so that's interesting to me that you've been you've been spending some time watching videos, sort of getting a sense of of the music. But you're not. Are you playing particular compositions? Are you are you do you think about playing as writing your own, or is it really just? Well, I'm just intuitive kind of for my fingers to find the strings and, yeah. and I learn. I listen to some now compositions. That's a long ways away. Something like <laughs> that. No, I'm and I've you know I I am not very musically talented. I mean, I love the rhythm and I try to find a groove and sometimes certain evenings it just takes off by itself. So it's very loose and it's fun. I have a few instruments. So I've played with a few friends together and, you know, somebody holds a kind of a bass, ry bass ry rhythm and then you go off and, and, and come back and forth. So no, no written notes. And do you find that you you make decisions about what kind of instrument you're going to make next based on the available um, uh, sort of bowls that you have? How do you how do you oh do you decide you want to make a certain kind of instrument and then you make it or or do you go and you're and you're sort of spending time and saying oh this is a great piece? I love yeah. the of music and so I've been really interested in. Um, music and throat singing and music from South Siberia. And I've been there mm. a couple of times and I've made those instruments and actually brought some back. My claim to fame is that um, a, a two, one of these Tuvan instruments that I made is now played in the Tuvan National Orchestra. So, you know. Fabulous. Was, wow, this is great, you know, and <laughs> the three string instrument. And so stuff like that. And then I see something else and I go, wow, how would it be to make something like that and go for it? As I said, it's not, it's just what I love to do. No, it's it's not it's not a linear planned process. It's responsive, no. which is which no. is in some ways, um, uh, you know, it, it connects to 
the longer path that your career has taken. And I want to take a, a step back and sort of talk about um, how you first came to your career as a sculptor and Turner working in wood. Can you can you share a little bit about sort of first getting started on on this path and what, if anything, um, are the benefits to your work as a sculptor or as somebody who's making sort of non-functional objects um, uh, from having trained as a furniture maker? Well, I come from a family, I mean, I don't think my father barely knew how to use a hammer. I mean, yeah. um, you know, he worked in a bank, I was supposed to do this. And um, I, I left uh, right out of high school and traveled, lived in Australia and then traveled back through Asia overland from Australia to, to Germany with a friend and we both decided that we wanted to keep traveling and we wanted to have a profession that we can do anywhere in the world and mm. work with our hands and we both apprenticed and I became a journeyman furniture maker and kept that going and then I did refinishing I mean I did um, restoration and then it also got into building and we had get into that later timber frame framing and stuff like that and so I can do dovetails I can do just saying that flat, straight, perfect, you know, I, I've done that. And um, this is a, you know, couple of pieces of furniture I did maybe like 25 years ago. This was a um, fine woodworking design book. And I did, you know, a bunch of these chairs. Want to go to the next Yeah, we can minute. go to the next one. And, you know, my influence furniture wise, especially once I landed in, in the States would be George Nakashima. And you mm -hmm. can see that here, this table, I just pulled it out as an image because it had so many different things that I was trying in there. You know, the simple, the understructures with all the lacing and the tying, and then I got into spheres. So there's a sphere in there. And, uh, but the, the soul of a tree, you know, the, the you know, opening, I used to do a lot of milling uh, my own logs and nothing is more wonderful than just open these trees up and see what's inside. So mm. th th there's a there's a love relationship here. Um, and and it, it morphed from furniture when we go to the next. Yeah, yeah, we can. And talk from a furniture, bit. then, um, you know, I probably credit David Ellsworth with uh, uh, his article in Fine Woodworking way back when to really push me. During my apprenticeship, my, my master had taught, um, promised me to show me how the lathe works, but I never got there. I did a little bit at the museum school in Boston, and then I'm pretty much self-taught a, a week with Richard Ruffon, and, and then, you know, learned from platters to whatever, and then got into Greenwood, and then somebody brought me this big madrone burl and I didn't know what to do with it because whatever you turn, turned into something else. And then over the years, I learned a little bit more about actually working together with the material to listen mm. to it, and not just control it. You know, in furniture, you got to control everything all the way through. And in mm. turning, there's a freedom. And also there's the immediacy. Um, you know, I love making furniture, but the process would be sometimes be just so long. I like that. dealing with a client, selecting the wood, and then maybe if somebody else could put this together, it'd be great. Uh, <laughs> you know, but turning is more is more immediate. It's quick, and and I love that I don't always know what it's going to look like. Mm. You know, it's there's always surprises. If I set up the wood right, let's go to the next. If I well, it's it, it's. It's it's responsive, right? And it's relational, which is one of the things that I think is so interesting about the fact that that so many of the turned forms and the turning that you're known for are these sort of suites of, of repeated objects that have to be in conversation with one another. And here we've got um, I I a great shot of you. <laughs> so I did a lot of teaching and I did a lot of demoing. Uh, for a while, it was really interesting. It connected me to a lot of people, doing a lot of shows, and I was really, you know, happy to 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 share what I had learned and like the physicality of turning. Mm. The hair is pretty bad here. I think there's another image it's worth, but when you can see, <laughs> I'm pretty. I I always overwork. So my there's a brace there and there's another brace, um, but I love the physicality of of the turning. That also strikes me as interesting in relationship to to the fact that that you're really enjoying making these musical instruments now, right? Because that is inherently physical, um, especially not just the the sort of playing as a physical act, but you're making these instruments that you really have to. They're they're not you're not making a small little piccolo, right? You're making an instrument that has a body, it has a shape, it 
has a heft to it and has to be in relationship to the body. Right, right. absolutely. You know, I look at pieces like um, uh, these where, where we've moved on from, from those sort of um, spherical forms, but you have these elements that are in conversation with one another, right? You have um, this kind of uh, uh, echo that comes as you move from one aspect of the piece to another. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, sort of working with with multiples, whether within one piece or 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 as a, a sort of larger part of your practice. Yeah, I'm a parts guy, you know. Yeah, <laughs> lots of parts, and I've always done that, and I, I I I enjoy that. So especially with working with Green Madrone, which is very unpredictable, mm. you don't really know what the piece is going to look like. So you might as well make a few more as you as you go. And there's a certain amount of waste, maybe 30, 40% of the times of the work that I do won't, won't be finished. It's great firewood. And I, what I do, I always also try new things out. And so that creates a certain kind of failure rate. Mm. And I have accepted that. Um, you know, I'm, over the times, you know, there's a few pieces I wish I'd, I'd never leave the shop. But I like the unpredictability of what's happening here in these two pieces where the actual making of the piece is not that difficult. I might make a whole lot of it. And um, so the actual cutting doesn't take that long. But then I go in there with microwave and I go with wedges and I pull things apart. And so the wood itself, the way I've chosen, the way I've cut it makes, uh, has a big, big part of how this piece in the long run will look like, you know. I didn't mm. shape these leaves in this book. I didn't shape these sticks. It's the grain inside as it loses its moisture has to move. The bone is very particular in that most people don't like using it because it is unpredictable. But the chances, the risk in all of that, I enjoy very, very much. And then we come to parts and maybe you have a, I don't know what the next image is. Yeah, like. we can talk about this. I mean, it's, oh. it's the, the, I think the, the work that you do, right? There are sometimes these component parts that are in relationship to each other, but it's, it's also your visual style and the way that you're working with materials changes or has changed it's, fairly. Yeah. yeah. To see a little basket is beautiful. But to see 10 of them together, all the negative space, all the interrelationship and how they move together, to me, all of a sudden it becomes a piece. Mm. So the same with the wall pieces. I arrange them and I play around forever. The biggest part, actually, to me, in a lot of those pieces is the arranging, is how they come together, how I choose that. And maybe we can, I know we have um look at some of these pieces, which are are have some of that kind of parts relationship but um right. uh yeah tell, tell me tell me a little bit about what we're looking at here so i make a lot of tubes for a while for a couple <laughs> of years I got the tubes and i thought well i'm getting older and the hollowing out of larger vessels is getting tedious and it hurts so then i figured what other ways can i make that and i said well i can drill these out so you get a lot of wood together and you put them on the lathe and you actually, you, I, I shape the outsides and then it, with these massive drills, I go in there, some of them bigger, you know, that big tube, that was big. Um, and then see what happens now. You know, mm. it was another one of those and I did a few that I liked and then I made 50, 60 more. And then, okay, and now what? I have a lot of that, and now what? <laughs> and, and um, I like the interrelationships. I like how things come together mm. and talk to each other. Um, and then there's the little details I go in there. So there's some burning, there's a stitching, uh, which are all like little signature parts of mine. If you actually go back for a second to the image. Yeah, please. let's do that. So this is- To, uh, to this yeah, one or to the book? Actually 25 years ago, Mm. Uh, um, something like that. I was getting divorced and everything I was doing was was burnt and scorched. And um, and these are actually hollow forms and this biggest piece there is actually like five feet tall. But what I wanted to bring in here is the color and bringing the metal. And at that point, I started to add copper and work with copper. I, I dipped that at a couple of the um, 
collaborative conferences and I learned from Greg Wilbur. And um, again, we're talking texture, texture always matters. And then the mm -hmm. hand is fold forming. So there's a whole nother element that kind of comes in there. But again, one of these figures is great, but look what we have as a family, as a relationship. Absolutely, and 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 uh, they they say something that is more than any one of them would say on their yeah. own. I think in that's, that's conversation with them together, yeah. You gotta you gotta find a way when to stop, and and there's always a few who just want to be alone. I mean, there's always <laughs> right. so expressive, you know, but it's it's all about relationship. There, it's all about how things connect. So. I it's interesting to me because I, I think that's something that you and Eshrick have in common in your outlook, right? This idea that, um, yes, there are pieces that are really important or significant to your work, but, but the environment and the way that pieces relate to one another and the way that objects are in conversation um, is really a part of uh, what's powerful about them. It's certainly a part of what's powerful here at the studio. Um, you know, I'm curious to talk a little bit about your connection with Eshrick. Um, I'm curious wh when you might have encountered his work first. Well, I think I've first seen it at the Moderna Gallery and then uh, with one of, at the, one of the international returning conferences that Albert Leacock put together, mm -hmm. we got a tour out there. And um, we saw we saw the museum. It's quite a few years ago, and I just felt at home. It's like, yeah, I know that. Yeah, this is great. And, and, <laughs> and you know, the 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 making making your home an extension of yourself, where you um, where do the door handles, you do the stairs, you do the steps, and yep, here we go. And I'm and, showing some images here when we were talking about this and talking about those potential connections between you and Eshrick, um, we started talking about the the home that you built for yourself, the home and studio that you built for yourself, and you're there uh, uh, getting everything together. And um, tell me a little bit more about what, what we're looking at here. Oh, this is crazy. You know, this is this seems like a long time ago. Um, <laughs> so this is a was a timber frame structure built on a Japanese uh, floor plan. Um, we didn't have enough money to finish it. So you could see there's one part is already finished. And then there's on the photo on the left, the addition finally comes out and it completes it. It's a central structure. And then the roof comes all the way around it. And it's beautiful. It's up in the mountains, 20 miles here with a big pond. My kids grew up, you know, in a, in a, in a beautiful place. And um, then, you know, one of, you know, I, I, I can get pretty tight. So when the in, in building inspector came to, inspect this timber frame structure which in this area is not done very often he says like i've never inspected furniture before but this works great you're done you're good <laughs> you know and, and um, it was a little too big it it took a few too many years you know to constantly work i mean i also had it my shop higher up and so putting the structure together but it was so much fun i'm pretty proud of it uh, I sold it 20 years ago and I will never, I know it's been altered a little bit. I don't want to look at it. This is my memory. So I think you have a few more shots of we that. We do. I mean, I'm curious about what was it about deciding that you wanted to, that you needed to, to create the space that you were going to live in sort of from, from the ground up that pushed you to do that? How do you see that as a sort of a part of your, your artistic practice or do you? Yeah, I mean, we already built, we already had built a very small house and two big studios. Um, my wife was a potter and, and then it was like, what would you, what, what do we really want to live in? And I go, let's just go all out and, 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 and do that. And at that point it was either, you know, a timber frame or a rammed earth. And I go, I'm not really so hot on concrete, but I really like it. <laughs> And I spent the entire winter putting all of these beams together with them. Um, and then here within two days, the whole structure went up and, mm. and doing it with a big crew and friends. I mean, it's just really amazing. It's an amazing experience. But I, I think yeah. that wanting to live in the house that you built yourself is making an extension of yourself, ref seeing yourself reflected. Mm. And, and this whole idea of just touching every part of it, you know, from the stairs to, you know, getting as, as little uh, pre-built pre things in there, you know, I mean, I did the entire kitchen and, you know, lots of it, 
you know, I don't have any finished pictures in here because they didn't come out. I'm going to move on. I love I love some of these these sort of detail shots where you where you really get a sense of um, these sort of wonderful angles and how you are I'm bringing the um, tree in there. That's yeah. why. Yeah. There. There's this big oak oak log, and then there's these Japanese scarf joints on top of that, and and probably my favorite. These two are the. My, favorite parts. This is a king post, a king structure that is, you know, is right over the middle of the house. And, and um, yeah, so. I think there's such an interesting connection there, right? That, that, that um, need to live in a space that is of you, right? Down to yeah, the smallest yeah, yeah. detail. Yeah. Um, and, pretty ordering. Yeah. <laughs> and in some ways, it, it, it links me, it, it links you to, I, I think about Escherich's sort of overall practice as being really interest driven, right? If there was something that excited him, if there was something that he felt like he wanted to investigate, um, whether it was architecture or <laughs> furniture or, or sculpture or yep. printmaking, um, being able to, to have that kind of interest driven um, rather than formal or material driven um, uh, artistic life. It strikes me that, that you and Asher both have that kind of sensibility. Can you talk a little about that? Well, it's a, it's a pretty, pretty personal thing. And, and it, it has to do with not, not enjoying to stand still, mm. you know, and, and, but one thing that comes is always learning something new the thing that comes along with it is lots of failure. You know, you fail a lot. You have to the way you learn. And we had a conversation about that before. We did, and I'm gonna I'm gonna just show some um, not not failures. connecting this to fa not failures, but just some of the other the other types of things, the other types of things that that the other ways that that your your artistic voice sort of materializes. Well, to stepping into a place that you don't know, that is something that's really important to me. Um, mm. if I know, I mean, there were some sculptures I made drawings for and I go, well, I can already see it. Why should I be making it? Um, mm. I don't get that much pleasure out of that. To do the same thing again is like, okay, um, doesn't excite me so much. So here we got actually the one on the right is in the Renwick, um, Ziggurat. And um, the one on the left is like, I got a bigger lathe and I put entire madrone stumps, bolted them on this lathe and let's just see what happens. It's pretty crazy. <laughs> it, it, it's pretty crazy. And, 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 and um, but look what comes out, you know? And, yeah. and so I've moved a lot, but so, you know, if I watch a lot of other artists, there's a very clear thread going through all their work. And I think my thread is a little harder to find because once I lose interest, oh yeah, we, we, we go to something else. Let's make spheres. <laughs> Somebody, a client ordered spheres for me. I got into that and I realized all the potential. So I made lots of solid balls. And then at one point that got a little old, but you have to make a living. And I sold, I made like three, four hundred 400 solid big balls that I sold at, at, at different shows. And then I got into, well, what happens when we go in there and spin them this way and that way? And, and then another thing was collaboration. I have to admit, I forget mm -hmm. who this is with, but um, I made a lot of baskets and it shows got to know a lot of other artists and they were like, wow, can we do this kind of together? And that always mm. is a great kick when you see like what somebody else interprets um, your, your, you know, your, your work with. Um, well, it gives you a new, a new way that. into seeing your own work, I'm sure. Right, right. Yeah. So I mean, again, I'm, I'm looking at, at more sort of pieces here where you you've done that kind of material combination and then there's something that is sort of quintessentially you about this but also it's totally different than <laughs> than other other series and 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 pieces that you've done that we've looked at earlier i got a lot of i got a lot of people making fun of me for these vehicles i made a lot of vehicles i had a blast they were so funny. Kids were growing you know, Everything in this house was about cars, you know, as little cars and they get older and they buy, buy a car, fix a car or something. Um, but the big part here is record collaboration. These are big collaborations, both collaborations with Bill, William Moore from Portland. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, and look what he did. I mean, I felt a little guilty because I just turned to five little baskets and he, these are hollow 
copper speculums that Bill works forever and his patina, his patina skills are amazing. But I like the movement. movement. And they bring out something new in, in your material, which is, I, I think, one of the things that's so wonderful about that kind of collaborative work yep. or, or work that does juxtapose materials. Um, you know, I know materials are hugely important <laughs> to you. Um, uh, and you and you work with materials that are sort of close to the place that you make your life and your home. Um, yeah. This interest in sort of inspiration from the, the materials that are accessible, available, close to you that are part of your daily world also seems like another really interesting connection to me between you and, and Eshrick. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you approach this connection to the, to the landscape and working with materials that are, that are drawn from close to you? Well, I use very rarely exotic woods and I don't like going to the lumber yard and buying a stack of boards unless it's for construction purposes. Even for furniture, I used to mill my, the wood with an Alaskan mill and I just did a big coffee table that I milled the wood 20 years ago. And then we slab it, we flat it. I do all, all of that. Uh, this, this was probably one of the biggest burls here. This is not me, um, but I do enjoy the chainsaw. I am pretty good <laughs> And this is a 6,000 pound burl. And here's my old friend is just cutting it in half. And he says, well, you don't have to buy the whole burl. You can just take half of it. And I say, yeah, right. I've never seen anything like this before. I'm taking all of that. <laughs> so, but for example, four years ago, and I've always lived on the land. So there's always trees to use. And we used to mm -hmm. mill where that old house was. We did mill, we milled a few of those beams, not a lot of them because the trees weren't really big enough. But a few years ago here in the storm, uh, a large, large limb came up off this big oak tree. I mean, big oak tree. And mm -hmm. the limb was still a foot and a half in diameter. And so I turned about 45 salad bowls out of that and gave them to my closest friends. <laughs> point was I didn't want to sell them. I didn't want to make any money on that. This was, you know, I was sad for this tree to go, but I wanted the DNA of this this wood to go to all these people that I cared for. And um, so I ended up actually just with one little one by myself, but um, I'll, I definitely like to use what's out here. I've been using lilac from an old farmhouse for mm. instrument pegs. And then still once in a while, I'll come in with details. I mean, there's nothing but a little rosewood or blackwood detail to put in there. And, you know, often woodworkers at the end of their life get rid of all their wood and then you pick up things like that. And, and, and you use that, so, but um, yeah. I want to move to, yeah. So oh, tell us a little bit more about what we're, <laughs> what we're looking at here. We're talking first about bad hair. And I think after <laughs> this, and I saw the bold spot, I felt like maybe it's time to get rid of that. Uh, <laughs> this is still up in, at the old house. And um, I'm starting to do lots of wall sculptures and realizing I'm always trying to push the limit of the lathe a little bit, you know? So this is a large plywood disc that has pieces mounted on it through the back. And then I turn, turn the fronts mm. of that. And, um, but I remember it's always pushing how far can I, can I take that? I mean, I did some baskets. They were like 300 the blocks were 300 pounds. The pieces were two feet in diameter. The bolt, the lathe is just about fallen over. So there's a tendency of pushing, 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 but also yeah. responding to the way that that, that yeah. things are formed, right? It's um, and what excites me. What, what, yeah. what does it excite me? Okay, let's do that. Is it going to work <laughs> out? I don't know. It's not the point. It's not the point. And so uh, tell me, tell me a little bit about yeah, um, how how these connect to this to this to this whole same, to this practice. Same story, yeah. you know. This is all madrone. In this case, I don't want it. I I put the one on the left, the block. I cut all these blocks. I left them out in the sun. I actually created a little oven to heat them so they would crack a lot. The mm. ones on the right, I made it so they don't crack. And and then I was again. It's again parts parts of something like this, you know, coming together and and uh, the whole idea of stacking, you know, people stacking stones and create things like that. And, and again, the fragility of it. I mean, solid, but very fragile, coming apart, gestural. 
Um, not my most successful series, and it makes me sad because I made actually quite a few of them because um, maybe it looks kind of random, but it sure ain't random. I mean, every part has been fiddled and put in there together. There's steel rods holding, holding all of this together. And to me, they're figures. I mean, I go very much there like, yes, they're bridges. Yes, they're monuments, but there's figures. They're yeah. still spinning. You know, they've been through a lot. And, and <laughs> um, so it's a little bit about life. You know, you go through a lot and you get beat up and cracked and you still stand. And that's what makes you beautiful. You know, mm. so I'm, you, you notice I'm not into shiny polished woods. I don't use a lot of sandpaper. And I actually have found very few woodworkers who love using sandpaper, yeah. but it's acceptable. And if it's functional, of course you have to, uh, but these are not functional. So it's all about the tool marks. Oh, yes. I want to move on to these two because I'm yeah. thinking about the body. I'm thinking about figures and these pieces I, always, yeah. you know, have that, that strong connection um, uh, to me when I, when I see them. Yeah. So the one on the right, um, actually I got an award at Society of Contemporary Craft in Pittsburgh. And, and um, so there's another picture shows it this a little earlier, but these are thin, eighth inch slices taken off, you know, the one on, on the right is actually take off that big piece where you see the guy with a chainsaw cutting that mm -hmm. big one. That mm -hmm. is from that. So we cut them on a bandsaw mill and um, absolutely no idea what's gonna happen. <laughs> and then you dry them slowly. Mm. And of course, when they're all cut from the same block, they have similar textures, they have similar movement. And to put that together here, the early ones were just in squares, but we already, you know, just like one up side by side. But I think there was an earlier image where I overlap them, play together. I don't use them necessarily from the same block. And then I use, I do a lot of sandblasting and a fair amount of bleaching. Yes, this is the wood in these is absolutely gorgeous. The colors are great, mm. but I was into the form, the movement, the texture on the surface. So by bleaching with hydrogen peroxide, you take the color out and you get, you take, it's like black and white photography. Mm. Where, you know, a black and white portrait is often much more interesting than I think than a color one, because you look at much more of the details, you see the bigger picture and, and here, so, I mean, you know, they're, they're figures. They're, they're no, figures you, get, you, you get that high contrast, right? And you have to pay attention to form because of, of what you've done. And I, and I think it's interesting to look at that compared to what we're looking at here, right? So <laughs> this is when they first get cut. I, mm -hmm. I don't force them. I don't put them into shape. This is in, 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 in the garage. And I'll just see what happens. And when the cat gets in, they all fall over and you put them all back together. And if that happened more than once, because then they <laughs> out and it all falls and then you stick it back up. But I don't want to interfere with the grain structure shaping the individual panels. Yeah. So unless some of them curl up and do something weird, then you can just soak them back in water and put it between clamps. And mm. you can do a little bit of that sometimes, you know. But this is, so this is the color, totally green cut. This is the original wood color really with water in it and if you put would dry them and put a finish on it you would get the same colors back so i just removed that color it's wonderful to see the process but also to see even in even in this this shot you're looking at something relational right you're looking at yeah. at how these things are in conversation with another with one another even in in, in how they are um in the middle of the process i want to make sure that we have time for for some questions so so if you don't mind i want to move um a little forward you are lucky enough to be represented in um the wood end exhibition not once but twice <laughs> the second yeah. time for a collaboration um uh that you've done and so i'm wondering if you we talked a little bit before about the sort of importance of collaborative work and collaboration in in what you do um you know i'm curious if you can talk about these collaborative pieces and and also how engaging with other artists inspires you and in the work that you're doing Okay, so this is an extreme case because this is, you know, a collaboration with Christy Kuhn and yep. we all live together as my sweetheart. So <laughs> that is amazing to be able to work together like that. And then it, uh, this happened pretty early in our relationship that we found, wow, we, we can connect these things. 
uh, our pieces together and we have a very, very close in sensibilities. Um, but we don't work together on the pieces at the same time. There's decisions being made and then you pass it on. Decisions being made and pass it on, which is very important to keep, to not get it kind of fuzzy in there. But um, so Christy is a felt artist doing sculptural felt. And um, I actually, some of these, this piece here was something I had turned a long time ago and it ended up in the attic. I didn't know what to do with it. Where, what, what, you know, it's this big disc, it's nearly two feet in diameter. It was difficult to make, I'll never do it again. And, um, but then it became what it always wanted to be a nesting, a holding, a holding kind of thing. Mm. And so this is a wall piece. And I think we have a few more images. We do, we have one, then, one more, uh, two more collaborative that. pieces. Yeah, look at that. I mean, I, I, I am in love with these pieces. And <laughs> quite a bit of more work in, in, in process. Christy does a lot of large wall installations and then in between she has time uh, to put these together. And, and um, I am continually fascinated about how, this, how well this really works together. And it's these shell forms and, and there's, life, there's life in there. And um, there will be a lot, lot more of that in the future. I can see that happening. So the other collaborations I did earlier would be at MLA conferences, mm -hmm. and, um, now Frogwood in Portland, which opened me up, especially to the metalwork, where because you have for seven days, you have 150 artists at MLA coming together. You've got as many studios, materials, tools, what you want, plenty of beer, and you just make. And I always chose to go to things that I didn't know and to learn. And as I said, I've especially learned from Greg Wilbur, a lot of the metal smithing and mm. hammering. I haven't, I just got new stakes and things, but it, it hurts, unfortunately, my hand, uh, the hammering part. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what comes for it. I can even see some green patina metal in here somewhere, but who knows? <laughs> I love that everything, and I think this is, it's, it's wonderful to end on these collaborative pieces that you've done with, with Christy, because I, I look at your career and your practice, and I think about it as sort of cyclical, right? There's not a linear trajectory, but there's a circling, <laughs> there's a circling back to themes and ideas and visual concerns um, in different ways over time. And again, I think um, that kind of a practice is is so connected to, to, to Eshrick's own. So I want to really thank you for, for sharing so much of, of yourself and what you do with, with us today. I want to make sure that um, we have time for, for any questions that folks might have for Christian. Um, and so if you would like to, you're, we're, uh, you can unmute yourself and, and ask or put those in, in the chat. Well, actually, I was just thinking one thing I wanted to add to that. Um, when you do that cyclical thing, I think it makes it a little mm. hard for people to follow you. And I don't think it necessarily helped my career because it goes, oh my God, Christian is up to something else and, uh, <laughs> and people are missing a, a, a center. But yeah, the center is there. It's just, there is, I, I like what you're saying about circular because I would always come back and I would find something that, you know, then I go back to and, and start up again. And now having a fairly good collection of my own work, I sometimes pull pieces out and go, all right, I know what to do with you. I'm going to cut you to pieces and I make this and that and have the freedom to do that. <laughs> well, and it, and, it, and it sometimes makes magical results like the, yeah. the instruments and, yeah. and we're so yeah. excited. Um, I'm so excited to see, to see where, where those go. Um, they are at once so different from, from everything else that you do, but also make so much sense in terms of the ideas, the themes that, that have seemed to excite you in a variety of different ways throughout, um, throughout your, your career. And it's, and it's really wonderful to watch. Um, any, anyone else? I'll do one last call for, for questions before we... Oh, we've got a, a thank you from, from from Sandy for sharing the process. It was great to, to hear so much about your process. I agree. 
Um, well, I hope that that people will spend some time with, um, we have some wonderful videos of Christian playing the piece on the Wood End website. Um, we can send out a link to that in the follow up for this conversation. And I'm so grateful to Christian for sharing so much of himself, his practice, and the way that he approaches um, art making with us today. And I wanna thank everyone for, for being here and spending, um, spending some time this afternoon with us. We typically, as we're saying goodbye after a program like this, um, uh, unmute ourselves, just you know, give a give a quick <laughs> goodbye before heading out. Um, uh, we're we're so thankful for you being here. We hope that we'll see you on on future programs. Thank you. Thank you for. Thank you. Well.